This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 6th of February 2024 at home in Wicklow. And in it, I discuss a movie I watched recently um, that is at the heart of something I'm very interested in. Um, And I also discuss an unexpectedly brilliant live performance that my wife and I attended um, at the weekend and another theatre experience that we had of just over a month ago so it's yeah it's an episode that's very much about artistic expression it's an episode about um, the live experience and um, receipt of performance, receiving live performance, and the, the 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 chemical transaction between performer and audience, and yeah, in the in the discussion of the of the film that I watched, which is which takes up the first half of the the podcast, uh, just a tribute to a, a great um, a great American filmmaker. Um, of, of of recent years relatively recent years and just you know a movie from early in his in his career that had so many distinctive things about it um and what a what a tonic that was and is and the subject matter of that film as i said something that i'm very interested in so um so yeah if that sounds like it might be your bag that's what's coming up. I hope you enjoy it and I will see you around the corner. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. Keep my mojo inside. Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. You're very welcome. How are you? I'm serious. How are you? Check in with yourself there. You don't have to report back because I, I can't hear you, obviously. But um, check in with yourself and just make sure you're uh, doing the best you can, maybe. Is that too, is that too um, preachy? <laughs> is that too pious? Come on now, guys. We can all do better. <sighs> is that ever objectively true? Can we always do better? Are there times when we are doing the absolute best we can and that might not look great that might not please the judges <laughs> but we're doing the best we can I'm very forgiving of that position um, not I'm not always I don't always succeed in being forgiving of that position in myself but uh, I'm trying to I'm always trying to kind of address that <laughs> Anyway, um, there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do today. So I, I've got to get through this and um, give you something that hopefully is is worth listening to, which you won't know until you get to the other side. But uh, I've got a big pile of logs. That's not a euphemism. I've got a big pile of logs outside in the rain that need to be moved into the shed. And... That is one of the missions today. Another mission is I'm getting my hair cut. Big news. Big news. Not that's no, tiny news. It's not news at all. But I'll be going down to my man Call in Avoca. Okay, there's a plug. There's a plug for Call's barber in Avoca. He's a good man. He's a Man United fan, unfortunately. And I still let him put his hands on me to cut my, my luscious locks. So that's on the agenda today as well. I'm hoping a decent walk up the hills with the dog as well, even though it's wet. It is a wet day. And yeah, it's it's not torrential rain. It's not lashing rain. It's just steady rain. And steady rain is, it somehow gets into you even more. It's just got that inevitability and that ceaselessness that is oh 
you've given me no choice. I just have to accept this. This rain is here to stay. And obviously, anyone <laughs> who has <laughs> any Irish person who stayed in Ireland for any part of their lives and reflected on this, understands this position. You have no choice. Just let it rain. Let it rain. Um, so, yeah, a few different missions today to run. And the podcast was another of the missions. So it's going to be a, a tight schedule. And I'll see. I'm not sure where this is going. Um, and I'm not even sure where I want to begin. So that must fill you with confidence. That must make you feel cool, cool. We're in safe hands here. This loo ball doesn't know what he's doing. But I never do, really. I mean, I never do when I sit down here. I just go, one idea, two ideas, three ideas. Maybe I can thread the needle. Maybe I can't. Um, but let me start. Let me start with... Let me start with a film. Last night, I rewatched Paul Thomas Anderson's 2002 film, Punch Drunk love and it wasn't an accidental choice there were two reasons i chose that movie one was i was interested i wanted to watch a movie that had a male a, a male character who was the main protagonist of the film and i wanted a male character in emotional and psychological crisis a male character struggling to keep it together. And I'm interested. I'm just interested. I mean, I'm generally interested in this area. Um, I'm interested in those iterations of masculinity. And I mean, I spoke about this maybe not so directly last week when I um, offered my thoughts on Alexander Payne's The Holdovers. And... The way Alexander Payne is so expert at creating or depicting characters, male characters of a certain social standing who are peering into the, the abyss of self and engaging with profound personal defeat or failure. And typically they are the they are not the alpha males, they are the, the beta males. They are sort of forgettable. If they were, these were characters in real life, they, they're kind of disposable, dispensable, forgettable characters. But in movies, they're fascinating. And of course, there's the comic strain that runs through Payne's movies, which just brings that extra dimension of enjoyment. But that's not what I was after. I was after something more, more visceral and more physical and something with greater velocity and punch drunk love and adam sandler's central performance came to mind and it also helped me achieve my second reason for wanting to watch the movie which was i wanted to see something with philip seymour hoffman who i was speaking about last week and i was referring to the really nice big picture podcast episode from last week where they paid tribute to his career um, but I really wanted to see his performance in Punch Drunk Love which is not it's 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 not a it's not a long performance it's not a you know but it's um, as in he doesn't have that many scenes he doesn't have that much to say <laughs> but he is so good oh my god and I was just looking at him and admiring him again as an actor and admiring his, just his extraordinary physicality. Um, he just, I think it's something that people overlook, how, how phenomenal he was at embodying his characters. He's such a physical actor, obviously an emotional actor, obviously an intelligent actor, an expressive actor. Um, a very complex and brilliant actor but physical the way he holds his body the way his bodies are are a product 
uh, of his character, you know, as in not Philip Seymour Hoffman's character, but the character he's playing. Um, just fantastic. And this character um, he plays in Punch Trunk Love is, is pretty, he's, he's really repellent. He is just awful. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's, he has a mattress, you know, a mattress shop, a mattress showroom. But, you know, he conducts himself like nobody knows the depths of what he's dealing with. The serious stuff that only he can grasp and comprehend. And the mattress shop is um, also a, the, a front for a sex line service that he runs at the back of the mattress shop. So he's got these, you know, these women in that, you know, classical kind of comical depiction, which I think, if I recall correctly, um, in Robert Altman's Shortcuts from around 1990, wasn't it? Um, one of the characters, is it is it Jennifer Jason Lee? One of the characters, you know, is, is, a, is a sex line worker who, you know, in the middle of her kitchen full of screaming kids is having, you know, the most explicit sexual conversations with, you know, the client on the other end of the phone, but looking utterly, you know, bored out of her brain. And Paul Thomas Anderson repeats the trick uh, quite casually as the camera passes by these jaded looking uh, fingernail checking women, you know, just, you know, talking about what different sex acts they're in the middle of or what they're going to do. And uh, it's a key plot point in Punch Drunk Love that one of these women tries to, um, you know, scam and exploit Adam Sandler's, you know, character who's just living on his last nerve and is just dying for connection, dying for connection, dying to be to be touched, to be held, to be seen, to be loved. And in his desperation, he, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll ring a sex line. And it just goes <laughs> so horribly wrong. And he's just... He's so nervous and neurotic um, that it was never going to end well. But ultimately, it brings him into into conflict and into direct conflict with Philip Seymour Hoffman's character. And there's this there's this great moment where they finally come face to face, and yeah, there's just something so pugnacious and obnoxious and aggressive and 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 scared you know in, in, in Philip Seymour Hoffman and he's just bluffing and yet he's not betraying any of it and yet it's in there it's, it's, I mean that's that's it that's something to pull off as an actor that this is an absolute bluff and this lunatic has crossed the country to come into my showroom to tell me, hey, you've crossed the line. Um, and it's, I don't know, there's just, there, you know, in any case, there's so many things that I liked about the movie. Can you hear that crow? That crow? Can you hear that rooster crowing in the background again? It's like, it's like the rooster's waiting for me. It's like the rooster's waiting for me to record. And he's like, I'm just going to, it's going to scooch around to the other side of the house and <laughs> and hang out by the window and make some noise for that guy. The rooster's name, which I could not remember for the life of me last week, is is Uno. Uno. That's right. It's, it's quite a cool name, in fact. Yo, Uno. How you doing? All right, good to know, good to know. Um, Jesus wept. That's what I'm dealing with here. That's what I'm dealing with. 
Now imagine if I was Adam Sandler's character in Punch Drunk Love, that rooster wouldn't be very long for this world. But luckily, I'm not. Um, Punch Drunk Love is, I remember watching it when it first came out. I didn't see it in the cinema, I saw it on, it would have been probably video at that stage, around 2002, 2003, maybe DVD. I feel it was a video. Uh, that was the only time I ever saw it. And I remember liking it, but maybe feeling it's no boogie nights. And it's quite a short film. Um, I threw it on last night and I was like, oh, it's only an hour and a half. It's quite refreshing when so many movies, you know, have abandoned brevity um, or concision uh, in favour of, you know, indulging their vision um, often to... Uh, you know, to, to, to sort of, to, to a poor return. But, um, I mean, right off the bat, you look at a movie like Punch Drunk Love and you go, what a distinctive and original filmmaker working in, you know, in, in the American, you know, film scene. Um, and he would have been very young still at that stage, Paul Thomas Anderson, but it's, it, it's got so many flavours to it. And fundamentally, Punch Drunk Love is, you know, about a really angry, lonely, unhappy man. Um, and that anger is a product of sadness. It's a, it's a product of rejection. It's a product of humiliation. Uh, and he's trying to do the right thing. He's trying to be a nice guy in the world. He's trying to conduct himself well. But he is just losing his mind. Um, and it's just about this guy finding love and the you know the, the object of his affection um, is played by Emily Watson, who at that time I suppose was it wasn't that long after breaking the waves, the Lars von Trier movie in which he sort of exploded onto the scene. Um, that's not a comedy, by the way, Breaking the Waves. That's a pretty heavy movie. But I remember being amazed by her in it. Um, and again, around the same time-ish, maybe a few years before, she would have done Jim Sheridan's The Boxer, playing Daniel Day-Lewis's Belfast Boxer's girlfriend. Um, one of my favourite love, uh, love scenes in the movies is just them reconnecting, walking through the streets of Belfast, having a chat but it's played so delicately. She's a very good actress. I think quite underrated. Um, she has a real light touch and her lightness meets Sandler's sort of mania so successfully in this. And they're both a little bit off kilter and there's just something that works so well. And I, I did, I glanced at one review that was just querying whether Adam Sandler can 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 Adam Sandler act, and and you know because this of course would have been one of his I don't know if he'd done a sort of an obviously dramatic role prior to this. I mean, it was Adam Sandler of the Wedding Singer and the Water Boy, and uh, I think Little Nicky was one of his more recent efforts at that time. I was never a massive fan. I liked the Wedding Singer. Um, and I like Happy Gilmore, the golfing one. But I wasn't like hugely in the Adam Sandler camp, and I would have been quite dismissive of some of the what felt like the more generic um, efforts. And of course, his stock in trade really was to be, <laughs> you know, and like a lot of comedy actors, you know, either. Everything was quite extreme because I'd like he could be really sappy, or you know, he, he, the most common persona was the the really sweet guy with the crazy temper. And I think obviously Paul Thomas Anderson saw something in there that was like this can actually play in the real world and not within the bounds of a comedy universe. Even though you can look at Punch Drunk Love and go, yeah, it is. A kind of a, a black comedy 
like there are dark comic moments in it and yet the through line is real human vulnerability and real human need and Adam Sandler uh, embodies it I think really really well and to to that question can he act I mean how how does one measure that because you hear people I've heard people all my life dismiss different actors you know and I kind of go are you serious do you know how hard it is <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to be believable to to be on a camera to be in a film to be in something completely artificial and seem real and for me that's it like there are of course better actors there is a scale but if you're believable in the world in which you've been placed and you can bring the audience with you and they stay with you and believe in you as a character then you've succeeded as an actor. Now that might sound like a very low bar, but that's it. Do I believe you? And sometimes it's very obvious when someone is perhaps miscast in something and you go, I just don't believe them. They just don't feel right in this world for this role. Or something just doesn't, something just doesn't disappear, um, you know, from off camera and it's that sort of immersion or correct fit like the right piece of a jigsaw puzzle puzzle into into the jigsaw when it fits it's we don't see the we don't see the outline we don't see the edges we don't see the you know the disjointedness um from being in the wrong place when it fits it fits and you go yeah i'll go with this guy and there was no part of me that didn't want to spend time with Adam Sandler in that movie, um, and it's it, it's you know it's 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 like a musical, Punch Drunk Love. It's like this weird, dark, manic, staccato musical, you know, neurotic and frenetic and tormented with these little grace notes here and there, and then this this. This um, very deliberate uh, stylistic choice or directorial choice where every now and again the screen is just filled with colour. Almost like Fantasia-esque flourishes of colour. Really bright, vivid colours. Sometimes in um, you know, vertical uh, you know, columns of colour filling the screen. Sometimes more like... Um, something astral or cosmic um, and I still I'm still not sure I, I, I'm a big fan <laughs> I'm a big fan of colour because the inner toddler in me responds to colour and responds to that visual impact of vivid colours um, and you know that, that 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 speaks to what I was talking about last week about how I, I, I like to meet the world with my eyes and very visual in how I respond to things or how I take things in and where they hit me. And I was, I was thinking about this the other day actually because I was again, um, and I've referred to it quite a lot recently. But the sixty songs that explain the nineties uh, podcast. I was listening to an episode of that, and. The, the guest being interviewed was saying how, how much they cry listening to music. And I was asking myself, do I ever cry listening to music? And I, I don't think I do. I don't think I have. Um, and it just reinforced for me what I was saying last week, that I cry at films all the time. Uh, I cry at, you know... At you know, TV, I can cry at an ad, <laughs> I can cry at a cartoon. There's very little that comes across a screen in, in dramatic form that if, um, if it hits a certain note, I'll cry. If I'm on that journey and I'm going on that journey, no problem. Um, but music, music, I have a different relationship to it. It, um, it's it's it, it it just it lands in a different place um yeah 
so anyway there you go but um yeah so as i say paul thomas anderson uh, you know in you know interrupts the the scenes or connects the scenes with these full screen color moments which are quite peculiar um but again there's just this kind of this this tone and tempo and none of it feels accidental because i think that's what good movie makers do they make deliberate choices they know what they're doing they're sure of what they're trying to achieve and there were tonal flavors and sequences that to my mind were very evocative of uh you know hitchcock thrillers um you know man disappearing down corridors being pursued lost in labyrinthine um hallways and staircases and then there were cohen-esque flourishes of absurdity um whether that's through characters or certain incidents um and in fact right at the start of the movie and i've completely forgotten this because again it's been over 20 years since i'd seen it um adam sandler's character gloriously named barry egan <laughs> it's a very um it's it's, it's just such a yeah it's such a, a beautifully gammy name um there's just no romance in that name at all uh, but his character works in this weird sort of little industrial complex um in in la and he kind of strolls out to the highway from his sort of warehouse space to just observe the morning and it's a big you know big empty straight stretch of road and there's just this sudden you know know, from out of nowhere extremely um explosive car crash that uh, it's just it was just stunning and brilliantly executed and not commented upon at all in in the narrative of the movie sandler observes it and kind of reacts with a certain level of shock um but that's it and you see a scattering of debris across the road um but that's it and it's again i'm i I was asking myself like what's (laughs) what what are we what are we meant to think what are we being told here this explosive moment it's you know at, at any point life can smack you in the head at any point your car can go off the road metaphorically speaking um and it's the sudden eruption of chaos and i suppose that's reflective of you know that that it sort of anticipates where sander's character is going um and yeah again but but kind of brilliant filmmaking like whoa uh i was not expecting that um and there's a couple of other little moments like that in the in, in the movie and then the other reference point that I found kind of creeping into my head, and it was something to do with the colour palette of the movie, and of course Sandler, um, and he wears this kind of you know bright blue suit for the entire movie, uh, which does not go uncommented upon by his seven sisters. Again, amazing bit of casting. These sisters who are sort of merciless to to Sandler. Um, you know love him but are unafraid to say anything to him and slag him off and um pull the rug from under him and obviously this is a huge a huge element in what makes him crazy um he just wants he, he kind of wants us to live his life and be unexamined and unscrutinized and not prodded or poked by these <laughs> these you know brutal sisters who are you know absolutely normal (laughs) you know on the scale of things and married and have kids and you know are doing their own thing but there's something about the way anderson sets it up um that you know you're you're just on edge going oh my god he hates this he hates being with these these women who have just not given him a second's peace his entire life 
and he has had enough he can't handle it anymore and they throw all his past failings in his face and all the times he's lost his temper and gone crazy and he's just like no more no more no more no more <laughs> stop um but the the yeah the other reference point was i found myself thinking of jimmy lewis um the you know the, the 60s um 60s comedian film comedian comic actor who did a lot of movies with dean martin um and as a kid i thought jimmy lewis jerry lewis sorry what am i saying jerry lewis i apologize not jimmy who, who the hell is jimmy lewis jerry lewis um you know jerry lewis and as a kid i thought wow jerry lewis is hilarious and as an adult as an adult um not so much just very sticky um and maybe a sort of a, an antecedent of uh, Jim Carrey or somebody like the physical comedy, the mugging. Um, and yet there's something energetic, like energetically speaking, um, in Jerry Lewis's physicality and the color palette of those 60s movies that just kept jumping into my head watching Punch Drunk Love last night. And again just to draw a connection jerry lewis of course famously played a very straight humorless version of himself in scorsese's the king of comedy um the you know the the de niro movie uh, which was incredibly prescient in terms of how it viewed celebrity culture and fan culture and, and fan obsession um you know taken to extremes and people's hunger for celebrity and fame and exposure which is brilliantly epitomized by de niro's rupert pupkin and then obviously a few years ago um when uh, joaquin phoenix was in joker which de niro also featured in um there were so many uh, and i'm sure not at all accidental there were so many nods and references um, um and almost kind of pastiches of the same themes that were so vividly laid out in the king of comedy so um yeah there's that so yeah punch drunk love i mean I don't know it's um if any of that stuff sounds like it might appeal to you like it's so worth watching it's so worth watching and it's got this uh, anxiety making soundtrack um and sound editing that just kind of makes you it just gets you inside his head inside barry egan's head adam sandler's head uh and you're like oh i do not want to be here and yet i have sympathy for this guy i care for this guy i want him to do well I want him to win. Um, and another, a special mention also to Luis Guzman, who's in, um, I mean, he's been, <laughs> Luis Guzman has been in so many movies. I was going to say he's been in quite a few uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movies, but I'm saying that without thinking that through. He's definitely in Boogie Nights. And I'm trying to think what other pta movies he's been in um nothing's coming to mind off the top of my head but luis guzman just gives a great deadpan comic performance in punch drunk love as an employee or yeah an employee of of adam sandler's character and he's kind of one of a crew of um i i, I guess like you know hispanic guys um or mexican who are working there in the in the warehouse and he just has this great uh unflappable non-expressive reaction to almost everything that transpires with this kind of great sort of stillness um <laughs> as he watches the chaos unfurl around sandler's character anyway there you go that's um that's 30 minutes there on uh, punch drunk love so um i hope you're a paul thomas anderson fan or an adam sander fan um and, and of course sander has done a few dramatic roles since then 
um, maybe most memorably in the Safdie Brothers Uncut Gems, which I've only watched once and thought was absolutely brilliant, but almost unbearably stress inducing. Um, and that was all, you know, all coming from Sandler's, you know, painfully self destructive character, um, just constantly constantly walking um you know close to the edge of absolute destruction um but that is a brilliant brilliant movie i haven't i kind of haven't been able to handle it since but i i know i will at some point um yeah no he's i think he's yeah i have a lot of time for adam sandler i feel um different things i've read about him and you know what i know about him now he's he just seems like a real good guy um very easy screen presence so um so there you go there you go punch drunk love um and all i'll say to sort of conclude that is you know if you've spent any time listening to the podcast as much as the general theme is one of wellness um there's no there's no question that i remain fascinated by the, the the sort of the, the male internal experience and the emotional lives of men and that landscape and I'm fascinated by that in in real life just as I am um, in in works of art and fiction movies whatever um, and you know, it's a, it's an area that I explore in myself, obviously, and an area I want to explore further in 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 other uh, creative or artistic uh, ways. So um, I'm not sure what that will look like, but that's definitely something that I feel like I'm leaning into more and more, and in no way. Does that mean I'm not interested in everyone's internal life in a general sense? Um, I just think, you know, that's 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 <laughs> that's where you get the real read. That's where you get what's really going on um, in terms of who is this person, <laughs> where are they at, and for me, it's always about the internal landscape. And the outside stuff is, you know, that can be diverting. It can be interesting. It can be attractive. It can be fascinating. It can be impressive. It can be lots of different things. Um, but it's it, it's looking under the hood. That's where the goods are, in my opinion. Um, and that's my area of, of of interest and where I'm more likely to to connect with someone um deeply i suppose anyway um so my wife and i were up in dublin at the weekend and we were heading to a school event my daughter was taking part in an event our daughter was taking part in in an event and i must say i was reluctant i was like ah i'm not sure (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure I'm into this. I'm not sure I want to give away my Saturday when I could be sitting at home watching Spurs, my football team, play. Um, but no, we went up to uh, the the Peace Proms, the Peace Proms, which were on at the RDS, one of Dublin's oldest premier event venues the royal dublin society the rds and basically what we were going to attend was this huge concert with school children from all around ireland and i really (laughs) i really just wasn't looking forward to it i thought oh this will be whatever but i could not have been more wrong 
it was absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant and basically what it was was and, and like it's an annual um it's an annual season and it features the cross-border orchestra of ireland which is ireland's premier youth orchestra playing a repertoire of music classical and contemporary pop songs dance hits films from musicals uh, songs from musicals um as well as some classical pieces uh there are guest soloists there are dancers um and there is a 2000 person choir made up of school children from different schools around the country and it was conducted and i feel bad now i should have looked up the guy's name but i mean you can find all this on on social media if you're if you're interested um it was conducted by an english guy who looked like he could have been in his anything from his late 30s to early 40s and he was fantastic he was fantastic he was clearly an excellent conductor and he was clearly in a very happy place he was so comfortable with the whole event hosting conducting linking different performances and artists and advocating for the cross-border orchestra of ireland advocating for young people to play music and to sing and just he just had the whole thing in the palm of his hand and it just reminded me it reminded me of something i've said before this idea of people want when they go to an event when they go to the theater when they watch something live when they're in the presence of someone who's teaching or facilitating or speaking whatever the situation might be ultimately people just want to be held they want to feel like i'm in safe hands and then i can relax and i can enjoy this because i don't have to be worried about being dropped i don't have to be worried about this whole thing going pear-shaped um and this guy was just the epitome of a safe pair of hands and of course that was very literal as well in terms of you know getting 2000 children these are primary school kids so up to kind of 12 13 getting 2000 primary school children to you know focus in a moment and stand in a moment and sit in a moment and sing at his command while conducting the orchestra while making space for soloists uh while having banter with the the the, the audience um and that sound when all the pieces were in place and you see 2000 school kids stand up and sing across a brilliant orchestra um and there's somebody at the heart of it just making it all flow and move and vibrate in the right way it was overwhelming it was such a powerful and emotional experience i just felt like i was on the verge of tears throughout the whole concert and it was too it, was, it felt like it was two one hour sets with a you know an interval in in between and i thought okay maybe this won't maybe I'll, I'll lose interest maybe it won't sustain but it did um and i just i was blown away uh, and my wife was the same and like and she you know she'd have a much greater understanding of what's happening musically um because of her own background but you know we were talking about it afterwards and she felt the same way um it, it was of such a high standard um and i don't know I, I think because as well because the focus is obviously on young people there's something about that as well that's even even more impressive because that level of dedication and application in 
in uh, young children and in, in adolescents and teenagers, it's really impressive. Like, it's really striking. Like, if if you open up your kind of heart to that at all, uh, you can't but admire it. Um, I mean, I used to see that a lot, teaching karate uh, and being in karate clubs and coaching kids, coaching young people to, to gradings or to competitions. And there is something... I don't know. I, I just think there's something really powerful um, when you see young people step up on their own and attempt to deliver um, and put all of themselves into that effort. Uh, it's it, it is it, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, and I, 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 mean, I used to find that moving as a as a karate whatever coach instructor. Um, our senior person in a in a in a in a martial arts setting, um, I was never not moved by that, um, and there's just yeah, you know, and and sorry, and and in what I just said, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that the standard wasn't fundamentally flawless, like musically, I didn't hear a bum note or anything faltering or be below the highest professional standards um, the other day. It was exceptionally good. And um, yeah, I sort of, uh, <laughs> I felt ashamed. <laughs> I felt guilty for being a little bit sneery in 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 advance of, of heading up. I was like, eh, are we really doing this? <laughs> but it was so, so good. And um, it was funny because afterwards I was asking my daughter, uh, I was kind of going, well, you know, like, you know, what was that like for you? And she's like, oh, it's just bloody noisy. And the kids were so loud all around me. And, um, you know, <laughs> you know, she was just trying to entertain herself throughout by playing with her pals when there were moments that, that they weren't singing. And it wasn't until we showed her my wife took several uh, videos, which we were encouraged to do by the, the conductor. Um, you know, my wife had several clips from the day and it was when she played them back to our daughter that our daughter was like, oh, wow, that was actually really good. Um, so that's also interesting, you know, like to be in it and not appreciate you are taking part in something really special and you're contributing to this. Um, so that was kind of nice. And sitting beside us where we were sitting, um, there was a mother immediately immediately to my left. And then there was a, a young guy, a kid, and his dad on the other side of him. <laughs> and for, for almost the entire concert, he was watching football matches on his phone or you know, the, the phone of one of his parents, um, and it, including the Spurs game that I was, you know, you know, wishing I could have been watching at home. Um, but I was very mature. I was very mature. I barely, barely glanced at the phone because I was so enjoying the the, the music and the uh, the live experience. But I just thought, wow, that young guy. <laughs> he's just, I yeah, you know, you know, The mother said he's just. It has to be about football. Wherever he goes, football, football, football. I was thinking, no man. I you know, I I wasn't there to judge. <laughs> I was thinking, this is messed up. Kids with devices and screens out at an event like that. Oh, it's just a shame. It's just a shame. But um, hey, it's not everybody's bag. Um, but yeah, it was It was excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure where the Peace Proms goes next, but it's. Um, I'm not sure if that was the first concert of their season. But it, um, yeah, um, I, I'd be, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to go again. So uh, I don't know. There's something that see. There's something about that communal experience as well when everybody's on board, and I, you know, let's 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 be clear. Like different events, there's a different dynamic, and that one with all those children there with. You know, I'm not sure if anybody from the audience, I'm not sure if anybody in the audience would have been unrelated to the children performing. 
are members of the orchestra. Um, you know that that's so that's a, that's a very particular audience of family members and friends um, and people connected to whatever the different school communities or the different dance groups or you know the, the players in the orchestra or whatever. Um, I sorry, just as I'm recalling the 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 event, one of the highlights for me was this young guy, maybe 10, 11, came out at one point as a featured soloist. And, you know, let's be clear here. There's a, a mode of of dress that seems to go with the classical world, but also seems to go with sometimes a certain sort of concert hall iteration of Irish culture that tends to be you know black pants a white shirt and a gaudy waistcoat um for men and you know particularly colorful skirts or or dresses for female performers um not 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 a look i'm all, i'm always drawn to um although i've worn a waistcoat or two in my time but um that was very much the case uh, for this concert. You know, this wasn't Nigel Kennedy, irreverent, you know, punk wardrobe while I play Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. Um, they were very, everyone was very much in the mode of this is what's expected. This is f- the formal dress and uniform for this this performance and this cultural expression. So anyway, this young guy comes out and he's got his black pants and his white shirt and like a, I think it was a gold waistcoat um ugh, anyway he also had a pair of sunglasses on and his instrument was the banjo and i swear to god this guy came out <laughs> and he had the energy of every lead rock guitarist that's ever strapped on uh, an electric guitar and you know made love to the crowd or made love to his instrument he was sensational and just like rocking that banjo (laughs) just giving it socks and it was brilliant and he had like i think he had two two moments and he just comes out like that's right that's right mfers you know i'm the reason you're here forget everybody else this is this is the moment we've all been waiting for it's me banjo man and i'm 10 years old or maybe 12 and holy hell he and he was brilliant he was brilliant like whatever he has to do it was brilliant as much as banjo playing can be brilliant but it was the attitude the attitude like he was you know he had the kind of the arched back leaning in just you know nebworth glastonbury you know wherever um it was absolutely fantastic and you'd want a heart of stone not to embrace that kid that moment that vibe that energy it was so so good <laughs> and you know there were adult soloists there was a great female singer who did quite a, she did a brilliant version of Sinead O'Connor's um, Nothing Compares to You, you know, really, you know, didn't try to be Sinead O'Connor, but like has a great instrument of her own and like was very faithful to the Sinead O'Connor version of the song. She was excellent. I think her name was Lauren Murphy. Um, and then there was an excellent Illin Piper, again, one of my favourite uh, Irish musical instruments, the Illin Pipes. And he was also a fantastic uh, whistle player. Um, I, I can't remember what his name was, but he was really really good as well um there were bagpipers I'm, I'm afraid i can't i just can't go there the bagpipes never quite land for me <laughs> but you know g- you know good as bagpipes go you know what can i say but my god that banjo player holy hell um you know led zeppelin eat your heart out this was just next level attitude um and but delivering the goods you know it wasn't you know there wasn't a disconnect like he was there he was with his instrument and he was wielding it like the axe it was chopping us down baby it was something else um 
Yeah. Um, I gosh, I don't know if I had something else to say there. Oh no, I did. I was what I was trying to get to was there's something about the you know the the youthful nature of of the performers and everyone's understanding that this is young people doing this. Um, I think it does open something up. I think it makes you know makes you in the in the audience. It opens up something that's a bit more sympathetic and embracing of what's transpiring between performers and audience and we had a well i certainly had a similar experience just just over a month ago almost exactly a month to the day that we saw that we were up at the 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 peace proms concert my wife and i and our daughter we went up to dublin in the first week of january to see the gaiety theater pantomime uh which was cinderella uh it was our first time to go but that's the 125th year of the pantomime in this beautiful beautiful theater it's amazing uh you know victorian era theater in dublin um, in which i've performed myself um it's it really is an impressive theater um fantastic and that was a great night out as well you know with an extraordinary um chemistry between cast and audience and this sort of you know fun filled knowing acknowledgement of, of the artifice but again a very high standard of production um and just a real uh relationship uh you know verging on kind of a conspiracy between the audience and the cast and the communal nature of it again it just elevates it um and you, you, if if you're you know if you're there unless you're i don't know on medication that's going to suppress every receptor in your body it gets into you you can't keep it out and it's like go with it or get the hell out of there because what's the point in being there otherwise um and that was absolutely excellent as well and there's just this kind of vicarious enjoyment when you're responding to other people in the audience um you know enjoying it and engaging with it uh, on such um an unashamed uninhibited level um that's really powerful um so yeah really really nice and i don't know it, 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 it's it's a real antidote to to cynicism and i look at both of those experiences the pantomime and the peace proms um and maybe punch drunk love as well you know th- these are works of art two amazing live experiences live theater performance experiences um and then the sort of the beauty of the 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 sort of the through line are the 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 main character's objective in punch drunk love which is to connect to connect and be connected to reach out and touch and be touched in return to hold and be held um and you know i think live performances like that as well i mean the, the the whatever's transpiring on the stage it's 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 an offer it's an offer like this is what shakespeare you know wrote about um you know we're doing this for you we're going to need your help to make this work um kind of to use your imagination to to flesh this out and we're doing our best on this kind of humble stage um but between us something special can happen so go with it see that's a very uncynical proposition that's a very uncynical proposition um and anyone who's ever been a performer or an artist or put themselves out there a player a musician a singer whatever you put something out there and you know it's an offer that you hope is going to be received but i'm telling you <laughs> very few audiences are like the audience at at the peace proms the other day 
or at the the Gaiety Theatre for the pantomime. And, uh, you know, we live in a cynical world and it's uh, it can be cold out there. But I think to to continue to make the offer is it's an act of defiance and it's an act of faith. Um, and, you're, you know, the act of faith is the world can be a warmer place if if we believe that this is worth doing. Um, and that's always the great sort of sabotaging agent of of art when you know it you don't believe in what you're doing and when there's other people who don't believe in the offer and when other objectives get in the way of you know the pure creativity and the pure creative offer um and that's the challenge to go i don't need to do that i need to do this this is the thing and I think the closer you can stay to the thing, the greater the chances are of connecting with the audience. Because whether they know it or not, the audience often knows the difference. They feel it and they respond accordingly. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I've got to go and put some logs in a shed. Again, not a euphemism. And maybe I'll drop a log on that rooster's head. Thanks for listening. I hope you got something out of this. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's it. I'm gone. I'm gone. I'm going to go and get wet. I will talk to you next week. I'll be back with something else. I don't know what that is. Um, stay safe. Stay well. Stay connected. Mind yourselves. And of course, as always, should you be so motivated, you can throw this pod some love using the respective social media channels, Instagram or Facebook mainly. Uh, the podcast goes out on YouTube every week as well. So all of those on all of those platforms, you're able to leave comments. Uh, you can leave reviews, ratings. There are other places to do that. Wherever you listen to the podcast, there should be an opportunity to do that. Share it, bump it on to somebody else, give it a recommend, whatever. All of that helps. It all helps. It certainly helps me. And if you're really inspired, <laughs> you can use the Patreon link to contribute financially to this independent production. And that is patreon.com forward slash the clear out. Okay, have a, have a great week. And I'll look forward to talking to you again real soon. Stay safe. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye.